Hello guys, got a video here for you today on the AGT Vulcan 3 and what we're going to be doing in this video is rebuilding the rifle. So in one of the other videos we broke the rifle down into individual components and in this video we're going to be rebuilding it. Starting off with the regulator. To begin with I'll get you a good look at the piston and also the Belleville washer stack. So as you can see here the Belleville washers are cupped in pairs in alternating sets and there are four sets on this regulator piston. The next thing I'm going to do is just add a small amount of dry lube to the actual Belva washers themselves. So dry lube is just a molly powder and I believe it just gives the Belva washers a little bit of lubrication. I am going to do it off camera though because this stuff does get pretty much everywhere and I don't want to dirty the bench. So a real small amount of dry lube will do us, and it is a completely optional step. You don't have to put dry lube on the Belleville washers. I just find it makes them work just a tiny bit better. The next thing we're going to do is just add a small amount of silicon grease to both the top and the bottom O-rings. Again, just a small amount will do us, wiping off the excess with our fingers. And then that can be put into the regulator body. Being nice and careful, making sure that the O-rings don't get pinched as we push that into place. Then that can be secured using the snap ring. With the snap ring in place, I'm just going to come through with an Allen key. Just push it into its seat and make sure it's where it needs to be. So I'm happy there. The next thing we can do is get our adjuster screw installed. And again, I am just going to be adding a small amount of silicon grease to this O-ring around the base. And we can get that screwed in. Now we're not going to be doing this up tight. I'm going to be doing it to about there. Then we'll add our lock nut. And the next thing we can do is reset the regulator adjuster screw position. So we're going to loosen our lock nut off, use a 4mm allen key to just do the adjuster screw in slightly, just until the adjuster screw is shy of the lock nut. Then we're going to lightly tighten the lock nut, and use a set of calipers to measure the distance from the top edge of the lock nut to the top edge of the adjuster screw. On this rifle is 1.13, and we're looking for around 0.9mm. And after a little bit of playing around, I think I'm happy there. So our adjuster screw is currently set to about 0.96. If we measure it in another place just to make sure, 0.95. That's roughly what it was before I took it apart. So I'm going to leave it there. The next thing we can do is make sure that the lock nut's done up nice and tight by using a 19mm spanner across the flats on the body of the regulator and then a 10mm spanner just to tighten the lock nut up. So I'm happy there. When we took the regulator apart, I did mention that the distance between the top of the adjuster screw and the top of the lock nut should be recorded, as that adjustment there is the set point for our regulator. If you needed to adjust your regulator for any reason, doing the adjuster screw in decreases rig pressure, doing it out increases rig pressure. And this particular rifle is a 177 sub 12 foot pound rifle, and from the factory the regulator was set at about 100 bar. With our regulator rebuilt, we can now move on to the rest of the pressure vessel, starting off with the valve assembly. So we have the valve housing, the valve pin, the valve spring, and then finally the adjuster cap. To begin with, we're going to take our valve housing and our valve and get that dropped into position. So I'm going to be doing that with a set of pliers, or a set of tweezers I should say, and then get that dropped into position. Then we can top that off with the valve return spring. And finally, get that capped off with the cap here. Now this cap does have a counter bore in it. That counter bore needs to face the valve spring. Get that dropped into the position. Then we can use some snap ring pliers just to do that up. Now 
Now what I've done is I've done the valve adjuster cap in till it stops. If we take a look at the valve pin here, you can see it depresses, although it doesn't go through all the way. What we're going to do is back out this little adjuster screw here until that goes in nice and flush. Now I am altering the factory setting very slightly, although when we took this apart I did recommend that you take the measurement between the top of the face here and the top of the adjuster screw. So if you took that measurement you can just use your calipers, set that to what it was before you took it apart and your power will be roughly the same. On this particular rifle I did find that the rifle was a little more efficient with the adjuster cap wound in a little so I am slightly changing the factory setting. And there we have it, just a turn or so out. The valve now depresses all the way and I'm quite happy with that. The reason that we're doing that little adjustment there is so that when the hammer strikes the valve pin, it has enough room to fully compress and doesn't stop prematurely. If it stops prematurely, there's a chance that the valve pin may bend when the hammer hits it. Now, to be honest with you, I'm pretty sure in the main block of the rifle, the hammer doesn't actually depress the valve all the way. So you probably don't need to do this step. However, I'm doing it just for safety reasons. Right then, the next thing we can rebuild is this little section here. And all we need to do to this is add the gauge. And then I'm going to be adding the FX bottle adapter. This is obviously a replacement part for the original bottle and it just allows us to put a removable bottle on the front of the rifle. Before we get into that though, there is just one thing that I would like to mention. In this piece here, if you can see in the hole there, there is a one-way valve for the fill pool. So the fill pool is this hole here. There's a drilling which travels through this section here and then we have a one-way valve on the end of that. If I take a T10 Torx bit, I can remove that and I'll show you it. And this little screw here just houses a small o-ring. Now I forgot to take this out in the disassembly process, but that little piece there just stops air from leaking out of the fill hole. So if you have a leak emanating from the fill area, it's more than likely this o-ring here. Now to put these back, they're nice and simple. All we need to do is feed it through the block and then get that screwed into position. What I like to do with these is screw them in until they stop, then back it out half a turn. What that will do is allow air around the screw threads, so you'll be able to fill your rifle, but air won't leak out back through the one-way valve. With that done, we can install the gauge. So the gauge has an O-ring on the base of it. And again, we are just going to add a little bit of silicon grease to this O-ring. Stick that into position. And then get that tightened into place using a 19mm spanner. The last thing I'm going to do is just add the FX bottle adapter to the front here. Again, this is an optional part and it's not fitted from the factory. Normally the AGT rifles just come with a fixed bottle, but I'm going to be adding the FX part. And same thing as before, just a small amount of silicon grease to this O-ring here. Get that dropped into position. Then we'll tighten the bottle valve onto it. And I'm going to get that done up nice and tightly with a 24mm spanner. And then the last thing we can do is just add the dust plug, just so it doesn't get lost. The final thing that I want to mention about the FX bottle adapter at the front here, is that AGT don't recommend that you install this par. They did comment on one of my previous videos, and they don't recommend installing this piece. This here is my personal rifle and I'm quite happy to install it on my rifle, but I don't necessarily recommend anyone else to do the same. But I thought I'd mention that as they did comment on one of the previous videos. With that said, we can now get everything bolted together so we can get the regulator and the valve installed into the cylinder. To begin with, we're gonna take a good look at the cylinder and locate the breathe holes. So we have one at this end, and then two at this end. This end is the regulator end, as this hole serves as the regulator bleed hole, which is this one here. So that needs to line up with that. So to get that put into position, we're gonna add a nice amount of silicon grease around these two O-rings here. It is pretty tight in the cylinder, so a nice amount of silicon grease. 
and we can get that pushed into place. The regulator itself is quite tight in the tube, so you might find it easier to use a screwdriver or something with a nice plastic end just to push the regulator into the end of the tube. Once it is started though, you can use the valve to get it screwed into its final location. And before this goes in, I am just going to add a generous amount of silicon grease to this o-ring around the base. The last thing I'll mention before we get the valve installed is that in the instructions, this rifle did come with this little piece of paper here. Now as you can see here, this little piece of paper is some information on the deep hanger. Although this wasn't fitted to this particular rifle, I don't think it's fitted to any of the sub-12 rifles as there's not enough room between the valve and the regulator. The other thing that I'll mention is, again, this is a sub-12 pound rifle and the regulator is at the back here. Although on the FAC rifles, I believe the regulator is mounted at the front so that you gain a larger amount of plenum. But whatever your rifle, just make sure the skinny end of the regulator is pointing towards the bottle housing. But with that all said and done, we can get this screwed into position. And with this end in place, we can now move on to the bottle housing. Again, I'm going to be adding a generous amount of silicon grease to this O-ring at the front here. And then that can be slid into position. The other thing that I recommended to take a note of when disassembling the rifle is the location of these bleed holes here. On this particular rifle, they were on the left hand side of the rifle, so I've lined them up again just to make sure the cylinder goes back in the same place. The end caps don't need to be done up mega tight in order to seal. The O-ring obviously seals inside the cylinder, so they can be left loose in order to get the correct length. But as you can see here, it goes like this in the rifle, so we have the gauge on this side, and then the transfer port facing up at this end. We can fine tune the location of all this in the rifle, but for now we're just rough setting it. So there we have it. And the very last thing I'll mention about the pressure vessel is that if you need any O-rings for your rifle, they can be found in the manual. So on this page here we have an exploded diagram along with the numbers. So make a note of any numbers that you need. Then on the next page we have all the sizes for the O-rings. So I'll get you a good look at that. Feel free to pause the video and just have a look. But there we have it. Right then, so next up we're going to be concentrating on the rear block and these are all the components that we need to install into this piece here. To begin with, this one here is the restrictor screw. So this is fitted to sub 12 pound rifles only. And it would normally go in this hole here and then travel through into the transfer pole. So you'd install that either by screwing it through this hole first, then screwing it into the transfer pole. However, on this particular rifle, I'm going to be leaving it out. As in my personal testing, removing this restrictor port and then backing off the hammer spring increases the efficiency of the rifle. Now I will say, removing this port here can affect your power, so if you do take it out, be very, very, very careful. And obviously, just remember, you are still bound by the sub 12 pound rule, if you live in the UK, of course. If you live elsewhere, obey your local power laws, but removing the restrictor can affect your power. I personally am not interested in going over the 12 pound limit, however removing the restrictor does improve the efficiency of the rifle, so that's the reason I'm taking it out. With that all out of the way, the next thing we can do is start work on rebuilding. To begin with, we're going to be adding the trigger unit to the block itself, and that's secured using these two screws here. These two screws are unique on the rifle, they're slightly longer than the ones that hold the plastic cover pieces on, as well as the cheek piece. To get that installed, I'm, all I'm going to do is drop it on the block like so, get the holes lined up, and then install my two securing screws using a T10 Torx bit to get those done up nice and tightly. Next up, I'm going to be installing the hammer. So the hammer has a little cutout on one side. This side needs to be facing the cocking arm. So to begin with, we're going to be pushing the hammer through the block, getting it lined up in the internal cutout. 
and then securing the little cocking dog in the side. And before that goes in, I am just going to be using some blue Loctite to secure the screw in place so it doesn't vibrate loose when we're firing the rifle. So just a small amount will do us. That's a little too much if I'm honest, so I'm going to wipe most of that off. Just a small amount around the threads, so about that much. Getting that done up nice and tightly. The next thing we're going to do is install the hammer spring in the back here, hooking that over the back of the hammer, just like that. Then we can install the cap as well as the little hammer spring guide in the middle there. Now I'm just going to be loosely doing this up for now, as we will have to readjust the power once the rifle's all built back up. So for now I'm just going to be leaving it all the way out. I am however going to be adding the small lock screw to the base here and that is just this little piece here, so a small grub screw. Again, this is unique on the rifle, and it's unique because it's short. Again, we're not doing this up tight, just doing it until it touches. With that done, we can install the first cover plate, which is this piece here, and get that secured in place using our three securing screws. Again, these are common throughout the rifle, and all of these style screws are exactly the same. Next up, we can just install this little bridge piece here, and that just covers over the cocking arm to stop it pinging out. So we'll get that dropped into position. And that's where we are so far. The next thing we can do is install the pellet probe. So we'll flip the block over. We'll take our pellet probe. And what we're going to be doing is adding a small amount of lithium grease to the outside of the probe. And that will just help it slide nice and easily backwards and forwards within the block. Now it's already still got some of the factory grease on it, so we're not going to add tons to it. Just a light coating will do. Next we can get that installed into the block, making sure that we have the cutout aligned with the top of the block, like so. And as we get that pushed into position, this hole here needs to be lined up with this hole in the side of the block. Next up we can take this grub screw here and get that done into the side of the pellet probe. Although I will say I am going to be adding a small amount of Loctite to this thread here just so it doesn't vibrate loose when it's in the rifle. And the bolt as you can see here is a dog pointed set screw and the dog point needs to be aligned with the cocking arm which is this piece here. So this cut out in the back. So we'll get that lightly put into position to begin with. And then if we flip the block once more, I'm going to be cocking the rifle. Get everything lined up nice and smoothly. And then we can do the grub screw in. And then finally, before the pellet probe will move backwards and forwards nice and freely, just make sure this grub screw here isn't hitting the sides of the block. So there we have it. We can feel that the pellet probe slides backwards and forwards nice and freely and that the grub screw isn't touching the inside of the block. So I'm quite happy there. The last thing we can do is add the spring ball detent. The first thing I'm going to do is just add a little bit of lithium grease to this hole here. Then we can take our ball bearing, get that dropped into that hole, push it down nice and securely, then add a little more grease to the top of that. And again, that's just lithium grease. The next thing we can do is add our spring plate, which is this piece here. Drop that over, get the hole lined up with the hole in the block. Then secure that using this securing screw and washer. And get that done up nice and tightly with our T10 Torx bit. And then the final thing we can add to the rear block is the cocking rod, this piece here. So we're going to get that hooked into the pellet probe. So this notch here hooks into this hole in the back of the pellet probe, just like so. And then we can get that secured using this screw here, 
although before that goes in I am going to be adding a small amount of blue Loctite. And then finishing that off with this little cap here, getting that installed using a 4mm Allen key. Right then, next up we have the midsection of the rifle, so we have the mid block here, barrel, cocking arm, as well as this little carrier here. To begin with, we're going to be getting the cocking arm installed, and first we need to choose which side we want it on. So I'm going to have it on the right hand side, as that's the side I prefer it, although you can install it on the left if you would prefer. To begin with, we're going to be taking our cocking arm and just adding a small amount of molly grease to the top and the bottom of the arm. Next, we're going to take this washer here, so this is just a shim washer, add that to the top of the arm, get that pushed into the grease, then just add a little more grease to the top there. Just a little amount will do us, we don't want tons here. Although if you didn't have access to molly grease, you could also just use lithium grease. The next thing we're going to do is install the arm into the side of the block, putting that in nice and carefully, and as that goes in, just make sure that the washer stays into position, as it can be knocked off when you put the arm into the block. What we can do then is just use an Allen key, push that through the hole, and just make sure that the washer is lined up with the hole in the arm. It can be a little bit of a pain to get all aligned for the first time, but once you have it in there, it should slot into position. So there we have it. What we can do now is take our little rod here and add that to the hole. Again, making sure that the cocking arm is lined up. Then we can use a two millimeter Allen key just to do that up. With the pivot done up nice and tightly, we'll just move the arm backwards and forwards to make sure that there's no binding. And then to the top of that, we can add the little lock screw. So this piece here. The next thing we can do is add our barrel. So we'll make sure that the cocking arm is nice and out of the way. Then install our barrel. What we're gonna do is install it a little way first. Then we can add the bumper O-ring, which is this piece here. And then the cocking linkage, which is this piece here to the barrel. You can see this side has a hole in it. This side is flat. The side with a hole in it needs to face the rear of the action. Next we can take a 3mm Allen key along with the dog pointed set screws and get the barrel aligned. So if we look at the barrel, the barrel itself has a number of flats on the actual OOD and we're interested in the back two. So this one here and then this one here. These need to be aligned with these holes in the block. So the rear one obviously to the rear and this one to this position here. For now, we're just gonna be doing one grub screw up, not even that tight, just pinching the barrel so it doesn't move on us. We'll get the actual position of the barrel cemented when we put the rifle together properly. Next thing we can do is secure the cocking linkage. So on this side, we're gonna be adding our little flanking plate, which is this piece here. We can do the same on the other side with the cocking lever. And again, we'll just make sure that that goes backwards and forwards nice and freely, which it does. You could add a little bit of grease to the barrel if you wanted to, so that the cocking linkage slides backwards and forwards nice and freely. Although on this rifle, it's already pretty free anyway, so I'm not gonna bother. With that done, that's pretty much all of the sub-assemblies built, so now we can get everything bolted together. Right then, so with all these sub-assemblies built up, the next thing we can do is join everything together. 
Now before we begin, in the disassembly video I did recommend that you take the measurement from the front of the barrel here to the front of the block here. So if you did go ahead and take that measurement, you can preset that now using your tape. Although for the purpose of this particular video, I am going to be assuming that you need help resetting all the linkage lengths. To be honest with you, the easiest thing to do is to leave the factory lengths perfectly well alone and just alter the distance between the two blocks. But I will be going over the adjustments briefly. So the first thing I recommend to do is to take our block here, loosen off the one screw we tightened up very, very slightly, and move the barrel all the way back, so towards the rear block. Then tighten the grub screw up again. And obviously as you tighten that up, just make sure that you're still on the flat. Then I'm going to be adding a small amount of lithium grease to this rod here. Just a real small amount will do us. We only really need it in sort of this midsection here. And then the next thing I'm going to do is cock the rifle at the back here. So just bringing the pellet probe back, getting the rifle cocked, and then leaving it in this rearward position. And that'll just make sure that both the pellet probe and the hammer are out the way as we install the barrel and the cylinder. And that's another reason why the hammer spring is all the way out, so that the rifle really can't fire on its own. With that done, the next thing I'll do is just make sure all these grub screws here are done out so that the barrel can enter the block nice and freely. And then we can get the two halves joined. So the rod here goes through this hole in the back of the mid block. Barrel should slide into the rear block nice and carefully. And then we can start getting things spaced out. So we'll flip the block over, align the barrel roughly so that the face of the barrel here is flush with the block. Then we'll get just one screw done up. With that in place, the two blocks should be fairly fixed. And then what I'm gonna do is take one of our magazines and just install that into the hole, making sure it goes in nice and freely. The barrel should just about be contacting with the magazine, but the mag should go in and out nice and freely. So I'm quite happy there. So as you can see there, the barrel is pretty much flush with the front face of the block and the mag goes in nice and freely. With that done, we can secure the barrel in the back here by tightening up the four bolts. So we're just gonna get those bolts done up nice and tightly with a three millimeter Allen key. Now at this point, I will mention that if you took the measurement between these two faces here, you can reset that now. From now on, you really shouldn't have to touch the four screws that secure the barrel into the rear block. Your adjustments are gonna be done using the four that are on the mid block. But if you took that measurement, you can reset the position. But if you didn't take that measurement, we're gonna be bringing back our cheek piece and using that as a jig. So what we're gonna do is flip the block up, take our cheek piece and get that pushed into position. And then I'm gonna get the cheek piece secured in place with just a couple of screws in the rear. And again, that's just with these bolts and a T10 Torx bit. As you can see here, our cheek piece doesn't line up. The hole in the cheek piece isn't lining up with the hole in the mid block, and the mid block actually needs to move back slightly. So all we're gonna do is loosen off the one clamp bolt that we have tightened, move the block back nice and gently until the hole in the cheek piece lines up with the hole in the block. So about there will do us. And then we can get that located just with our screw. I like to get both sides done up, so both screws installed, and that just makes sure that the block is being pulled nice and squarely. With that done, we can take our three millimeter Allen key and just get the four clamp bolts done up. 
And with that done, I'm going to be removing the cheek piece again, just in case we have to reset the location of the pellet probe. The next thing we can do is get our caulking linkage hooked up, and we're going to be securing that using this grub screw here. If you take a close look at the end of the grub screw, you can see it is slightly pointed. This is unique on this rifle, and this bolt just goes in this hole here. So we'll put that nice and carefully down there. Then we can bring the cocking arm back until we meet the actual rod itself. Then we can get our grub screw installed. Although before this goes in, I am going to be adding just a small amount of blue Loctite to these screw threads. And then if we take a look at the rod itself, you can actually see that there's a factory dimple. So this dimple here needs to be aligned with this hole and that just stops it rotating when the rifle is in use. With all of that we can start checking some of the linkages. So the first one we're going to check is the length of this rod here. So this rod controls how far in or out the pellet probe travels. The ideal location for this is so that the pellet probe, the brass piece here, doesn't hit the magazine as we pull it backwards and forwards. So at its current location here, it's a little shy of the block, but as we pull the cocking arm out, it comes forward slightly, then goes back. So as you can see there. Now if we put a magazine in the rifle, you can see that the pellet probe travels nice and freely through the magazine. If this rod is too short, you'll either not be able to get the magazine installed, or when you go to pull the arm back, the magazine may bind. So again, the ideal position is so that the pellet probe is just shy of this face here, when the rifle is in its normal battery. So just like so. As you can see here, the pellet probe does travel forward ever so slightly when we open the cocking arm but this shouldn't protrude past the face of the block. Now the procedure for changing the length for the rod is nice and simple. All you need to do is use a 2.5 L-shaped Allen key, come in the back of the action like so, loosen the locking nut, so there is a small locking nut in the back here, you can loosen that off, and then using a 2mm Allen key, loosen this screw here. With both of those bolts loose, the rod can be turned. And tightening the rod, so turning it clockwise, shortens the linkage. Turning it counterclockwise increases the length of the linkage. I would recommend adjusting the rod one full turn at a time, tightening both of the locking bolts, then rechecking the measurement. Once you're happy, both screws, so the one at the front and the one at the back, can be done up nice and tightly and then the rod cannot move. Right then, before we can connect the trigger, the next thing we need to do is install the cylinder. And before that goes in, we're just gonna make double sure that the transfer port is aligned with the top and the gauge side is aligned with the left of the rifle. So this side here. Hopefully you can see that there. Now we can get that slid into these two blocks here being nice and careful not to scratch the anodizing as it goes in. If we take a look at the back here, by just moving the cocking linkage, or the trigger linkage I should say, back slightly, you can make sure that the two holes are lining up with the two holes in the cylinder. There's two dimples there, and these two grub screws, Align with those two holes, so we have a big one and a slightly smaller one. They can be done in, again, just very carefully bending the trigger linkage out the way slightly, getting the grub screws started, then getting those done up. It is recommended to do the larger one up first, as that is pointed and it will pull the cylinder into the correct place. And there we have the cylinder into position. The next thing we can do is install the trigger linkage, so we'll get that hooked up. 
And before we do that, we are going to decock the rifle by pulling the cocking arm all the way back, then pressing down on this sear at the back here. So just this one. So holding the cocking arm back and then pushing down on the sear. As you do that, you should hear a slight click and the hammer should move forward and it's no longer arrested by the trigger sear. Now we can get the trigger linkage hooked up. So if we take a look at the trigger linkage, which is this piece here, it has one side with a dome on it. This is the pin side. And on the other side, it has a little hole in it. And that is the socket side. What we need to do is use a flat bladed wide screwdriver, separate the clasp, then hook the pin side into the hole in the trigger sear. So this piece here. I'll try and do it on camera for you, although it is a little tricky to do. But there we have it. So there's the clasp put into its place. The last thing we can do is just give that a little squeeze to make sure that the pin has traveled into the hole side or the socket side. And there we have it. The next thing I want to talk about very briefly is the trigger itself. Now, I do have a full video detailing the adjustment of the trigger, so I'm not going to be going over it again in this video, but the short version is, if the trigger linkage is too long, you will not be able to engage the safety. If the trigger linkage is too short, the rifle may not cock, but again, I would recommend leaving the trigger rod alone, as the factory settings should work perfectly well for your particular rifle. And as long as you follow a basic setup procedure, the rod length shouldn't need to be changed. But if you do need to adjust your trigger rod linkage, we do have the full video, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. With that done, we can start getting the furniture installed. So to begin with, we'll install the cheek piece. It just goes into nicely into position like so. Making sure to split the cheek piece at the front there. Next, we can get the eight securing screws installed, four on each side. And again, that's just these little ones here. With the cheek piece installed, the next thing we can do is get the top brow and the shroud put on. Starting off with the top brow, the first thing we're gonna do is make sure that the bottom is nice and clean. Then we can get that dropped on over the top and secured using the two securing screws. These are the same length. Before we get them done up tight, we are just going to make sure the rail is nice and parallel with the block, which I'm happy there, so I'm going to get that done up nice and tightly with a 3mm Allen key. Next up, we can screw our shroud on. And as that goes on, just make sure that there's a small amount of gap between the shroud and the block itself. So as you can see there, we have a small gap there. Right then, so with that done, that's pretty much the entire rifle rebuilt. Now we can gas the rifle up and then check the power over the chronograph. So typically speaking, you would have the standard bottle installed on the front there. Then you would connect your rifle up to your whip, pressurize the rifle, and make sure that you have no obvious leaks. Now on this particular rifle, because I have the FX bottle adapter, I can just screw the FX bottle straight onto the front without needing to connect the rifle up to my dive cylinder. But there's just a couple of things that I want to go over before we do that. So when filling any rifle up from bone dry empty, sometimes air can leak out the end of the barrel. Now, to be honest with you, that is fairly common. And there are a couple of things you can do to sort of mitigate this problem. The first is to cock the rifle before you fill it. What this will do is just make sure the hammer isn't pressing on the valve and it will just make the valve's job a lot easier as it won't have to fight hammer spring pressure in order to seal. With that done, if when you connect your dive cylinder up, pressurize it up, if you get air leaking out the end of the barrel straight away, first of all, don't panic. Sometimes it can just take sort of 15 or 20 seconds for air to build up in the plenum and then force the valve closed. So what I'd recommend doing is connecting your dive cylinder, opening the bottle up nice and wide, 
and then if the rifle leaks straight away, leave it for 15 to 20 seconds and try and get some pressure inside the plenum. If after that time the rifle still hasn't sealed, what you can do then is point the rifle into a nice safe backstop and fire the rifle a couple of times into the backstop. What this will do is cycle the valve and hopefully after a couple of shots the valve will seal against the valve face nicely and air should stop leaking out the end of the barrel. So again, very quickly, first cock the rifle, next connect your dive cylinder, open the valve nice and wide, and then if air starts leaking out the end of the barrel, leave it 15-20 seconds, and then start dry firing the rifle. To be honest with you, there's not normally a problem with the Vulcan 3s, However, on something like an AGT Eurogan 2 with a sort of semi-balanced valve, sometimes the valves need a little bit of help to seal. But with that said, we can just connect our bottle and hopefully it should pressurise up with no leaks. And then once the rifle is pressurised and holding air, we can decock the rifle. And if we take a look at the gauge, you can see that we've got just over 100 bar in the rifle. So what I'm going to do is fill the rifle up to sort of 150, 180. Right then, and there we have it. There's the rifle filled up to just under 200 bar. What I'm going to do now is put the rifle over the chronograph and just set the power. To do that, I'm going to be coming in the rear of the rifle, loosening this lock screw here, then adjusting the hammer spring in the back here. So going in with the hammer spring should increase power and coming out should decrease power. But I'll get that set off camera, then I'll bring you back and we'll put the rifle back in its stop. Right then, so I've got the power set. It's running about 11.6 foot pounds with GSB heavies, which is pretty much perfect for me. The next thing we can do is get the action installed into the stock. And to do that, we're just gonna flip the action up, line our stock up, Drop that over like so, and then get the two securing bolts done up nice and tight with a 5mm Allen key. And there we have it, there's the AGT Vulcan 3 fully rebuilt and ready to take down range. The only other thing that I'll mention as we've got the stock on it, is that if you have the power adjuster, too far out, sometimes it won't go back in the stock as the power adjuster will come into contact with the stock. So just make a note of that. But there we have it. That's pretty much going to do it for this particular video, guys. So thanks very much for watching. I hope it's been useful and we'll see you in the next one.